Hey guys, I wanted to make a video showing you the update on the robot prototype transmission that we're doing. As you can see in the frame, we have one corner kind of assembled in a jig for testing. So I'll just give you an overview of what we did, some of the changes that were made, and how it seems to perform so far. So as you can see, we just made a wooden jig to hold it, and this is going to be one of the corners. So there's one of the aluminum sections, and there'll be four of these, and they'll be bolted onto an outer perimeter on these two bolts, and then there'll be another one bolted on out of phase over here for one half of the robot. Now, just like in the CAD, you can see on the one inch aluminum, everything is pretty much mounted to it. The SEM, our shifting box, an idler, and then even our uh, whole steering assembly, as you can see here. Now, some of the concerns that people had was in the shifting, and I'll show you how that performs in a bit and the cantilever on this axle. Now what we ended up doing was actually using a steel axle so we're not really worried about at all about it bending at all. And as you can see it's double captured with bearings on the aluminum. There's a half inch bearing here, there's a half inch bearing on the inside of the bevel and then there's a coupler on the middle of this C. As you can see the way we actually interfaced it is we took one of the wheel hubs and we attached it to this block. And there's a coupler here that goes all the way down and it'll plus a little bit extra. It's actually used for the spacing for this bevel. And then the bearing that's pressed inside the bevel rides on top of this hub. And then just two countersunk quarter 20 bolts holding this coupler on this block. As you can see, here's the assembly. These are the wheels we just had laying around, but we could also use the high plexion wheels if we decide we want to do that instead and there's just enough clearance there where if we do change wheels it still won't be an issue that's just the retaining clip keeping the steel shaft aligned and the steel shaft is keyed to this coupler so that's not going to move as you can see from the block it's pretty much very similar to the cab we didn't round off these corners or make it pretty or anything but the block itself pretty much weighs absolutely nothing and at least from all the testing we did this block is going to pretty much survive and this axle I don't think really is an issue cons anymore considering it's made out of steel. Now pretty much as you saw in the CAD, the way we set it up is we have the wheel going to a one-to-one -one sprocket ratio. Now this is actually here for several reasons. One of the reasons is, is one, just to transfer the rotational force. But another reason is this is allows us a very easy way to modify our transmission ratios. All this gearing on the top is 8 to 1 or 16 to 1. However, we can modify that even more up here so we could either fine tune it by putting a 10 and a 12 tooth or any which way or even more extreme like a 2 to 1 ratio where we could do a total ratio of 4 to 1 or 8 to 1 if we want extremely high speed or again we could go the opposite way we could have much higher torque. So having these sprockets here allows us a lot of versatility and fine-tuning what transmission ratios we want. The shifter is set for a 2 to 1 ratio, but again, the fine-tuning can be controlled by these sprockets, which is one of the big advantages of doing it this way. And as you see in the CAD, we just have a chain tensioner here, which is a bolt with two quarter-inch bearings. Now, this could be sleeve bearings. This could be one of several things, but we just had these laying around inside the slot, which is very easily adjustable. So between each match as needed, we could adjust the tension without it being much of an issue. We usually avoid using chain under high force situations because it stretches and the performance is a little bit different every round because it keeps stretching. So with this tensioner here, we could adjust it on the fly very easily, just loosen it, push it on, tighten it, and be done with it. That's a couple second fix. Now let me go over the rest of it. As you can see, we have a shifter piston here. This is just one we had laying around. It's 750 bore by whatever the stroke is. It doesn't really matter. We're just using it for testing here. And from our testing, even with this size bore, at least unloaded, well, we loaded it on with a piece of wood, but from our testing, even 30 PSI is enough to not only keep this engaged, but actually shift from side to side. So we could either use a smaller bore, or we could use a bigger bore, which means it could work on less pressure. But the idea is to have probably a half inch stroke piston by the half inch or three quarter inch bore. So maybe just a much shorter version of this to do this actuation. This is just mounted here because I don't have the other half, but this end of the transmission, 
I mean, of the piston will actually be mounted to the opposite corner of the shifter block. So on here, it's on this side, and on the other one, it would be on the opposite side. So it would extend our force angle that we have around this pivot point. So I did pretty much just eyeball it about the orientation with this ago, but it's not that critical. I just wanted to get in the rough orientation. Now, as you can see, there was a slight modification on our block instead of just two plates. I actually took a block of acetal and I machined it out. This is actually, this stuff is actually quite rigid, at least for this application. And one of the biggest concerns people had was using the piston is when we engage it, it'll actually cause the gears to bind up. Now, before I made a recent modification, that was indeed the case. The more pressure we put, the more it bounded up, and it was bogging it down quite a lot. However, there was one very simple modification I did, which I knew I was going to do something like this since the start, but this makes it no matter what the pressure is, the spacing will always be perfect when it's engaged either way. And the little trick is, I can show you right now, is this guy down here. Now on this axle that's for this cluster gear, we put a specifically sized spacer here. And this spacer ensures that when it's engaged and butted up against the aluminum channel, let me zoom back out. And butt up against the aluminum channel. No matter how hard the piston is pulling, the spacing will always be perfect due to the spacer, which is on that same axle. So no matter how hard this piston pulls, these gears will never bind. And the same thing for the opposite side, although it's a little bit different. On this side, I just took the axle and I actually had to machine it down because when it's fully engaged, it was actually too big of a diameter. But again, that wasn't a big deal. All I had to do was reduce the diameter down. And now the same thing applies. No matter how hard the piston pushes, it provides the perfect spacing with these gears never bind. So let me just go over the actual transmissioning. There's a 14 tooth pinion on the sim with a retention clip on top. There's a 40 tooth cluster to a 20 tooth. On the opposite side is 20 tooth to a 20 tooth. Both of those on the top are connected to this 40 tooth on top. If you can see it, that 40 tooth is clustered to a 14 tooth, which is buried in there and you can't see it, which goes to this 30 tooth idler, which goes to this 40 tooth spur, which is coupled to the bevel. As you can see here, this spur is actually pressed in to this bevel and it's also keyed. We had to make a special bearing holder type thing, this black thing down here, to hold the bearing concentric with the spur. So there's bearings all over this thing, so we're not really worried about it bending, distorting, or having any kind of issues. As you can see, the bevels are mated. Oh, let me get the orientation a little bit better. The bevels are mated pretty much perfectly. You might not be able to see it on cam, and then goes to the rest, which I have already talked about. And pretty much, as you can see right now, this is only temporary for this jig, but we found the swarm drive, which is attached to Bainbot's 4 to 1, which is gonna be run by a 550. And for right now, just to keep it from moving, we have it just clamped on. But this motor will be attached rigidly to this one inch block, depending on the orientation of the robot frame. So it might come out this way, or it might go out that way. Or we have, we have room to put in one of several different ways. But again, this is just temporary, and it seems like this ratio is pretty ideal, and it should work just fine. Now I'll actually power it on so you could see how it runs. But now I just have it attached to uh, a bench power supply. It'll do 30 volts, but only 5 amps. So you'll be able to see as I could bog it down a little bit, but once it hits that 5 amp limit, that's when it starts overloading the power supply. So let me just show you real quick. Let me check the pressure. There is no pressure in the system. So I'll bump it up to 60. And I'll start running it. I'll go all the way up to 12. As you can see, it's drawing 2.9 amps, which is actually less current than the Bainbot draw idle. But this is the highest current draw out of all the positions, so direction and high and low gear. So this is the highest, and all the rest of them are between 1 and 2 amps and I'll show you those as well. As you can see right now, it's in one of the gears. It's in low gear. 
or rather high gear. And then when I flip it, right now it's in low gear. And as you see, that transition was extremely smooth and more or less instantaneous. There was no delay whatsoever. And I could go back the other way. As you can see, there's absolutely no issue in regards to shifting. I need to pressurize a little bit more because there's, there's a leaky system and it's a pretty big bore piston, so there's a lot of volume that's consumed. Now, the reason this turns is because the steering motor keeps sliding, but once that's rigidly attached, this won't jitter when it's engaged. So, again, this side is about 3 amp, shift it. Right now it's about 1.94 amps. And then if I change directions, it'll be even less. As you see going in this direction, it's 1.8 amps and low gear. And when I shift it, it looks like it's about 3.5. Earlier was lower, but we'll dig into that. But the point is we could optimize a little bit more and there is no binding here. It may sound like it on this side, but as you see me putting counter pressure on it, doesn't make the noise change or the current any less. So that's just the way it sounds. It's not a binding issue. I'm recharging the air because we run out pretty fast. I see one gear. Another gear. No issues whatsoever. So as you can see, the system seems to work quite well. I didn't show you being loaded down because I'm out of hands. I can't record at the same time. But earlier we did load it down with a piece of wood and we did get to five amps in high and low gear. And the only limitation seems to be is the power supply. Once we actually get the whole robot built and attach them, we'll test the whole system as a robot and see how it performs and see if we run into issues at any higher currents or any issues like that. So as you can see, the whole thing is pretty much assembled with a few minor tweaks like these hard stops will prevent them from binding. The pressure seems to work great. It doesn't need to be 60, it works just fine at 30. The size of the piston looks like three quarter inches of an inch is good. The shifting is instantaneous, there's no slipping. And part of the reason for that is, let me let the air out. As I guess you can see on the shifter is the pinion on the sim is always engaged with one of the gears. I made the spacing so close that there is no room in the middle where the sim can spin. It is always engaged with one the other one. As you can see in this situation, if we're trying to shift into the other one, but the teeth line up on the peaks, if I could get the right position on that, like that, that might be an issue. However, that's why the sim always needs to be spinning. So when we're doing shifting, we could detect if the robot is moving quite easily on this idler, 30 pin idler pinion, that's actually pinned with a screw all the way through and either side is actually bored out or you could either take down the outside of this for a speed sensor. So this shaft is used to detect speed. So we know if the wheel is being driven, so anytime we want to shift, we just have to make sure the wheel is moving. Either the robot is already moving where it's being back driven or if we want to shift, we just got to give the sim a little bit of power to move. When we do that, we found out that it never actually binds. When we want to shift, it will shift every single time. It just doesn't work when it's sitting static like, like this because sometimes it'll bind. But as long as one of them is moving, it will always engage without any issues, without any grinding, and it's instantaneous. And as you can see, that's because the spacing is so tight that it's always engaged with one. So as soon as it starts disengaging, when it's mostly disengaged, it starts engaging with the other one. And keep in mind is that both of these gears are spinning in the same direction. So they're not fighting each other. The only difference is that they're going twice the speed. So worst case scenario, when you try to engage at one moment in time, it'll be peak of tooth with peak of tooth. But because it's still engaged with the opposite one, 
a fraction of a second later, it'll be peak to tooth to trough and it'll engage. So even if worst case scenario, these two peaks hit a fraction of a second later, because it's still engaged with the other one, it'll be peak to trough and it'll fully engage. And when it does, it disengages from the previous one. So with this precise spacing, there's never an issue where it really can bind. And from the testing we've done so far, there seems to be no issue pretty much whatsoever. Everything is in bearings, everything is real smooth, and at least from the testing so far, it seems to be more efficient than just running one of the Bainbot transmissions idly. So that's pretty much the current status of the project. Now we just gotta order more parts, make three more of these, build up a robot, and then hopefully program it and get it all tweaked out before the robot scene starts so we can start actually doing the manipulator and refining this assembly for actual competition bot. So that's pretty much the current status of it. Hope you guys like it. See you next time.